everyone. So today we're talking about leveraging NLP techniques for effective asset classification strategies. Uh, specifically, this relates to the financial field uh, and how we can use natural language and natural language data to derive insights into different investment strategies or just different applications within the financial landscape. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump into the, to the slide set. And the first thing I want to talk about is why we make use of NLP and finance to begin with. Um, so I would say that for historical reasons, a lot of financial data comes in the form of natural text. It's not really designed with the uh, with sort of a computer in mind, right? So a lot of these texts have, for historical reasons, been developed for humans to read them and humans can understand them just fine. But uh, an automated procedure based on that sort of textual data is quite hard to uh, attain, especially in a reliable way. Uh, so that's where NLP techniques can really come in and help speed up processes and uh, remove just a bunch of time uh, that's that otherwise would be spent by uh, people to analyze these kinds of texts. I think one additional point that is often overlooked is that NLP can really help to increase uh, sort of accuracy of various um, you know tasks in in finance and also provide new analytical insights to to a lot of the investigations that are being conducted. Uh, and that kind of brings us to the focus topic of this talk, uh, which is going to be specifically concerning classification of assets, uh, namely funds, which are going to be the examples of this of this talk, uh, according to the exposures, that is the investment strategies in this case, of those funds as outlined in the associated fund description. Uh, so for the funds, you have a fund description that's associated with it. It's a static piece of information that comes with the fund. Uh, and from that, you can sort of read the information about the fund and understand, okay, what does this fund uh, invest in and what kind of exposures does it have? And based on that information, you can then classify it. Uh, and that's what we want to do in an automated way uh, using NLP techniques. So a sort of crude approach to, to this classification task would be to look at those fund descriptions as they are and simply try to identify keywords in them that are sort of associated with the exposures that you're not comfortable having. One example would be, let's say you're looking for unlisted companies. Uh, you could look for the keyword unlisted in the fund description, but there's a number of problems with that. So firstly, and most importantly perhaps, is that the word can appear both in a, in a positive way or in a negative way. So what I mean by that is you could have a fund description saying that the fund is not allowed to invest in unlisted companies, but based on a simple keyword search, you would then classify it as, you know, restricted or a sort of a risky investment strategy, even though it's it's that's not what it uh, tells you. Uh, so the big benefit, of course, of keyword based searches is that they're fully transparent. And that's the reason why they're sort of still sticking around in the financial landscape, even though they're not very sophisticated and don't really uh, provide that much insight into into analysis of this text. Uh, the other option, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, is NLP based identification. Uh, and for that, uh, we're making use of NLP models. Namely, I'm going to be talking about BERT and XLNet during this talk. Uh, but the big benefit here is that they're more sophisticated. They grasp the contextual information about the, about the text and can classify them in a more accurate way. Um, the drawback, of course, being that this is sort of a black box um, application that we're putting into um, this classification task. And as such, it's harder to have the same transparency that you would in a in a keyword-based classification. Uh, moving on, we're gonna look at two fund descriptions just to get a taste of what the classification we're looking to do is. So the first one we're looking at is the Vanguard 500 Index Fund. Uh, and we can see from the investment strategy, which I have printed to the top left, uh, that this tracks the S&P 500 Index and it invests mainly in large cap stocks. Uh, if we continue reading, we can see that specifically invests in large US companies. Um, and so the meaningful information is summarized to the bottom left there. Looking at the time series for this asset, we can additionally see that it's, uh, it seems to be quite liquid or it's, it's heavily traded anyway. And the time series is, very, uh, is updated very frequently. So our conclusion here would be that this is not you know, an, a risky investment strategy per se. Uh, a particular investor might not wanna invest in this, but uh, as for the investment strategy, there's nothing to sort of indicate that this should be restricted in some way. Uh, moving on to the next example, we have Another fund uh, whose investment objective is to achieve long-term capital appreciation through equity and equity-related investments, primarily in a portfolio of small and medium-sized and unlisted Italian companies. Uh, so a number of sort of alarms uh, go off here, or a bunch of 
uh, or several points for consideration, uh, and namely that we have an unlisted company exposure, uh, which is immediately something to be aware of. Uh, there's also an exposure to small companies, which is not necessarily you know a big um, sort of cause for concern, but but nevertheless we have that. And then we also have a concentration to a small market, namely the Italian one. Looking at the time series for this fund, we can see that it's definitely less frequently updated than the last one as well. And this is something that could uh, quite possibly be tied to the fact that it's investing in unlisted companies. And so liquidity might be, might be an issue here. Uh, so due to this fact, this is something that would probably be considered a risky investment strategy. Um, depending on the particular investor, again, it might be uh, you know, that they're comfortable in having an exposure to, to this. But in general, I would say this is something to be, to be aware of and to be more cautious of in general. So these are the two kinds of assets that we would like to, to classify and distinguish between. Uh, and that brings us to the models that are being used to, to do this classification. As I said before, we're going to be talking about BERT and XLNet. But those two models depend on something called a transformer architecture. So first, we're going to discuss that real quick. Uh, and the transformer architectures were developed primarily with translation tasks in mind. Uh, so they can be used for other things as well, a number of sequence to sequence tasks that they're called. But uh, for the sake of this discussion, let's focus on translation tasks. So let's say we have an sentence in English and we want to translate it to French. Um, what we would do is we would use the architecture that's displayed to the, to the right here, and we would input the French sentence at the bottom. Uh, and then on top, we would get out the French sentence. Uh, and what this architecture consists of and how it does this is it, it uses an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder is to the left and the decoder to the right. Uh, the task of the encoder is to take this English sentence and transform it into an internal vector representation. So it takes a sentence, and for all the words in that sentence, it transforms those into a vector space, so they're represented by vectors. This vector space is not just an arbitrary vector space, but it contains information about the syntax or the uh, sort of contextual information of the words. Um, what that means is that if we have two words that are similar, for example, couch and sofa, they would be transformed into this vector space into vectors that closely resemble each other. So the way uh, the vectors point and their magnitude is sort of indicative of, of the meaning of the words themselves. Um, once the encoder has transformed this to the internal vector space, the decoder then has the task of decoding this into a sequence again. Uh, so the decoder will then take this um, you know, vector space or these vectors in that vector space that we just uh, transformed and transform them into a sequence in the new language. So in French now, according to the example that we're discussing. In addition to just providing this sentence, uh, the model or this architecture also need us to provide something called a positional encoding. Uh, what the positional encoding tells us is essentially where in the sentence a particular word is. So it gives us information about the relationship between the words in, in the sentence. Uh, because naturally, if you have a sentence, the order in which the words are aligned is definitely has an importance or an effect on what the meaning of, of this sentence is going to be. Um, when this is used in practice, uh, one normally stacks encoders. So it's not as simple as just the architecture that is played to the right, but rather you would have something that more closely resembles what we see in the, in the small box in the middle, where we have a number of encoders stacked on top of each other, then leading to a number of decoders and then having an output. But for the sake of understanding, um, the, the general takeaway is still the same. Uh, so invert and XLNet, they specifically make use of the encoder part of this. So they don't make use of the full architecture. And that's why we'll look at the encoder in a bit more detail now. So we can see a zoomed in version of the encoder to the, to the bottom right here. And it is mainly comprised of, of two components, or there's two main components in this architecture. First, we have a multi-head attention block if we start from the bottom. What this does is it helps the encoder look at other words um, as it encodes one specific word in the, in the sentence. So as we said before, the position and relationships between words uh, have an effect on, on the sentence itself. And if we want a good vector representation of the words in a sentence, we need to consider all of them uh, and we need to consider their relationships. And that's what this multi-head attention block does. So we have an example here uh, in, in the uh, box where we, where we have a sentence, uh, namely, the boy thought he was home. And if we consider the word he here and we want to encode this into some vector representation, uh, we would not get that much information by just seeing the letters H and E. Um, rather, he gets its meaning from the context which it resides in. Uh, 
Uh, namely, he refers to the boy in this case. And so what the multi-head attention block does is it considers the um, sort of interconnectedness between the words uh, and it codes them appropriately. So the output of this attention block is gonna be a weighted sum of all the words. Uh, so we remember we encode a word as a vector and all the words are different vectors. So if we take a weighted sum of all the other words, that's just gonna be another vector. And so it outputs a weighted sum of these words and the weights are according to how much the word in the sequence is influenced by the other words in the sequence. Uh, that's indicated by the transparency of the lines in, in the box. So we can see that he, for example, is, is uh, quite intertwined or influenced by the and boy. So the boy influences he a lot, uh, whereas, for example, home, the word home is not very strongly influential with, with he in this example. So that's the attention block. In addition to this, we have a, a neural network in the architecture. And the nice thing about this uh, neural network is that it's the same for all the words. So remember, we said that all the words will pass through the multi-head attention block, and then they would go to this feedforward network. And because the feedforward network is um, the same for all of them, the computation where we essentially apply the network to the vector is going to be parallelizable. So we can do this in parallel for all the different words passing through the encoder. This is a minor detail that is of, of big importance because a lot of these models, uh, for them to be successful, they need to get really big. And in order to get big models, you need to be able to train them. And for that, it's essential that um, you're able to do so efficiently. And being able to do parallel computations is, is crucial to, to you know, good performance during training for these kinds of models. Uh, so it's a small detail, but it has a big effect. And the same thing can be said for the multi-head attention block. That can also be executed in parallel. We're not going to go into the details of that, but just know that both of these can be uh, parallelized, the computations, and that, you know, increases computational efficiency a lot. So now that we know how this encoder works, um, we're going to move over to BERT. So BERT is a model that uh, took the world by storm, I guess you could say, because it became state of the art for a lot of NLP tasks. Uh, it stands for bidirectional encoder representation of transformers. And transformers are just what we discussed prior to this. Uh, and in a nutshell, what BERT is, is a sequence of encoders stacked on top of each other. Uh, and then you train that model. It's a huge model uh, that you train in two stages. First, a pre-training stage to teach it sort of the um, conceptuals of a language. So you train it on a really large corpus, like Wikipedia, for example. Uh, and you teach it to understand language in its uh, basic form. After you've gotten it to understand that, and most of the parameters are sort of... Uh, trained or attuned to what they should be, then you would move over to something called a fine tuning procedure, where you train BERT on the specific use case that you want it to perform on. And so the parameters are only slightly adjusted, uh, but just so to, to fit the tasks that you're trying to solve. The reason for this is that BERT is a massive model. And so if you wanted to train it from the beginning on the specific task, it would require uh, huge amounts of, of training data, which is simply not feasible. So that's why it's chopped up in these two stages. So you can use a really large corpus that you have available, like Wikipedia, as I said, uh, for the pre-training. And then the fine tuning would be a label data set or something that you need to uh, tailor make to the specific use case that you have. BERT works by having a internal word representation in a, in a vector space with dynamic info about uh, surroundings. So very similar to what we discussed before. Um, to give even more insights on, on what this means, we have a, an example here of dynamic word embedding. So if we consider uh, two sentences with, which both contain the word bank, we have the first one which says that the man was accused of robbing a bank. The second one says the man went fishing by the bank of the river. Now, if we only consider the word bank in these two sentences, that would be encoded to the same spot. Uh, but naturally, bank here refers to two very different things in terms of what we just conceptually uh, think of it as. The first one is, is, an, is a bank with money, and the second bank, uh, bank refers to a river bank, which are two very different things. And in BERT, these would get different embeddings, which is good because it shows that BERT takes into account sort of the context of a word rather than just the, um, well, sort of characters that make up it. BERT can be trained, as I said, for a number of different tasks, and mainly there are four ones um, that it's, you know, four general ones that it can be trained on. Um, the ones of interest for this sort of classification task that we have in mind is, firstly, sentence pair classification, in which BERT takes two texts, a pair of texts, and then a continuous output value, which it uh, should then produce. Uh, and one common use case of that would be to take two 
sentences and measure the uh, semantic similarity between them. So if there are two identical sentences, you would expect an output of, of one. And if they're completely unrelated, you would expect an output of zero. And you teach BERT to say how similar two sentences are in that way. Uh, another task that is going to be of interest to us is single sentence classification tasks, uh, which is when you train BERT on receiving one text, and then you have one target uh, output variable. So one example there would be sentiment analysis, which is quite popular in, in financial settings, where you get a sentence, and based on that sentence, you deem whether or not it's positive or negative, for example, whether the connotation in the sentence is positive or negative. Um, so those two are of interest. Uh, we have two other ones, but I won't go into those in detail because they don't uh, directly apply to, to this classification task. Uh, but instead, we're going to go over to the pre-training stage. Uh, which, as I said before, is sort of the bulk of the training procedure where you train it on a large corpus. Uh, it teaches BERT what language and context are, and it simultaneously trains on two unsupervised tasks on this big data set. Uh, the first task is something called mask language modeling, in which you take sentences from, from the text corpus that you're analyzing, and you mask out some of the words. So one, one example of a sentence would be, uh, the quick fox jumped over the lazy dog. And then you would mask out two words, for example, quick and jumped. And you would ask Bert to identify those two words or sort of predict which words are under the masks. So Bert doesn't have information about those words, but rather it needs to predict them. In combination with this, something called a next sentence prediction task is applied. Um, so what that means is you provide Bert with two sentences, and the task is for Bert to classify whether or not they follow each other. Uh, so what that means is like if the second sentence naturally uh, should come after the first one in, in just a text uh, according to what you would expect. So one example there would be, I'm going outside, I will be back after six. Those two sentences make sense to have after each other, so the output should be yes. Another example would be, I'm going outside, two plus two equals four, um, which, you know, naturally they, they don't sort of belong together, so the output there should be, should be zero. Uh, and on BERT, which is displayed at the top right, we can see a number of outputs on the top, uh, which are the ones used for this training. In interest of time, we won't go into all the details of, of these outputs and sort of what they do, but um, just know that the leftmost one, labeled C in this example, is, is for classification, and the other ones are for uh, the mass language modeling and then also for various prediction tasks that you can do with BERT. Uh, both of the tasks that we are concerned with for, for training BERT uh, were either, well, were classification and sort of um, similarity between sentences. And so both of those would be outputted through the C port. So we won't really consider the other ones uh, in this talk, but just know that there are more outputs other than the ones described. Uh, once the pre-training is done, we would move over to a fine-tuning stage, as we said before. Uh, and now the encoders in the architecture. So if we go back to the previous slide, we can see in the BERT model, uh, some faint circles, which represents the encoders. And so all the parameters in there, and there's a lot of parameters, uh, they would be fitted accordingly. And now that we move over to the fine tuning states, the encoders already possess an understanding of language and context. And now they need to get slightly modified for a specific task. Um, in addition to just training it a bit more specifically on the task, you would also attach uh, something else to the output. So we can see at the bottom right that we have BERT again and we have C output, but this time we also have a classifier attached to the C output. So we would add something small there, for example, a, a neural network um, used for classifying according to the task that we have in mind. And in the fine tuning stage, this small classifier, so this is nowhere near uh, the amount of parameters that the full BERT model has, but this small classifier would then be trained according to the, to the task. And in addition, the models internally in BERT would be slightly adjusted to, uh, to also fit better to the particular task in hand. So that is really the procedure that um, you would take to, to train it on something specific. So to tie it back to the task that we had in mind with these fun classifications, uh, if we consider first the single sentence classification task, what we could do is we could provide BERT with these sentences from the fun description and we would ask it to classify whether or not that is restricted. Um, simple as that, just give it in, uh, provide a label data set so you can train it on uh, you know, various use cases. And then hopefully if, if you have enough training data and everything goes well, then you've built yourself a classifier that can identify these fund strategies and then classify them accordingly. The slightly more intricate solution, which uh, 
provides you know additional benefits as well is to consider a sentence pair classification task. Um, what you would do then is you could provide these input sentences from the fund classification or from the fund description. You would additionally provide a informative sentence, for example, unlisted company exposure, if we're looking for that. And you would train the BERT model to classify the output according to whether or not those are, those are similar. Uh, and in that way, you could use a number of different uh, descriptive input sentences. So in you know, replacing the exposure to unlisted companies to basically gauge how much um, risk you have in multiple risk dimensions. So one dimension would, as I said, be unlisted companies. Another one might be small markets, for instance. You could measure those independently with this approach. And then depending on the particular risk preferences of the individual investor, you could then tailor um, this risk classification according to, according to the use case that you have in mind. So it's a bit more granular and a bit more flexible, that sort of framework, but it's also more complicated in terms of training and then just sort of the infrastructure that um, surrounds it. Nevertheless, that's how we would train BERT. Um, in addition to this, I wanted to quickly mention ExcelNet because it's replaced BERT as sort of a state-of-the-art model for a lot of these NLP tasks. And the reason why it's replaced BERT is uh, because BERT is mainly because BERT uh, faces a problem during the pre-training stage, uh, specifically when it comes to this masking of sentences and then predicting the words. Uh, the problem that BERT experiences is outlined in the top right of this slide. Uh, so we can see here a, an example sentence, uh, which reads, when she goes to the mask, she buys some mask. And we want to predict what's under, under these masks. Now, one way this could be replaced is that when she goes to the mall, she buys some clothes. Another way would be when she goes to the cinema, she buys some popcorn. Both of those make sense. Um, but another way we could replace it is when she goes to the cinema, she buys some clothes. And that sentence doesn't really make sense. I mean, sure, you could have a sentence like that, but it's quite unlikely that those are actually the words that we would replace it with. However, the problem with BERT is that it doesn't consider the uh, interdependency between the different masks. So the last sentence is equally likely to be replaced by BERT, um, well, equally likely as the other two that are more correct or that we would expect uh, to be the actual replacements. And that's shortcoming of BERT, which Excellent solves. Uh, it does that by something called permutation language modeling, um, in which it contains or considers all different permutations of these maskings um, in such a way that it doesn't get biased in, in the way that BERT does during their training procedure. Um, there are quite some additional considerations that need to be taken into account in order to get this to work. Uh, one such thing is something called two-stream attention mechanism, because when we do this, um, permutation of, of maskings uh, in order to maintain parallel computations and efficiency, uh, one needs to sort of provide information in a, in a more um, sophisticated way so that the model doesn't, so the model has all the information it needs, namely like the positional encodings of the different words so that it knows where it's trying to predict what, uh, but so it doesn't have transparency of the word itself. And so there's a few sort of details to how ExcelNet then differs from, from BERT, but the bottom line is that this problem is what's being addressed and it does so by considering permutations of, of the words that are flowing in. Uh, so for the sake of this discussion and in the interest of time, we'll simply leave it at that when it comes to ExcelNet. Uh, there's plenty of other resources to do an in-depth dive of, of what these consequences are. Um, but I wanted to bring this back basically to, to the conclusions that we have for this talk. Uh, and the conclusion would be that pre-chained language models attain a contextual understanding of the asset descriptions without the need for um, enormous training sets, uh, you know, during the fine-tuning stages. Uh, we had two approaches that we considered. The first one was single sentence pair or single sentence classification, where we would simply provide these fund descriptions and train the model to classify them as either restricted or not. The slightly more advanced approach uh, would be to use a sentence pair classification architecture where we provide the two sentences. So firstly, fund description, and then a descriptive sentence. So for instance, unlisted company exposure, just to keep on the same example. Uh, and then we would gauge the similarity between those. And by doing that with a number of sentences, we can then attain multiple dimensions of, of risk for our evaluation. 
Uh, I want to also say that for optimal performance, of course, uh, pre-processing steps are going to be required for this. So it's not simply a plug and play solution that you uh, plug into all the fund descriptions because the fund descriptions can be quite long, right? And you need to identify where the most relevant information is. Uh, so there's a number of techniques for doing that. That's not something we will go into, um, but, but definitely um, that's an important consideration to, to ensure that the reliability of these models are, are good. Um, Bringing it back to what we said in the beginning as well, these NLP-based asset classifications can be coupled with the keyword-based ones. Um, the reason why one would want to do this is because it can provide uh, some rigor in terms of what the evaluation will be. Uh, so if stakeholders are, for example, not very comfortable with just having an NLP-based classification uh, model, you could require that both the NLP classification and the keyword-based classification both give out a positive indication for it to be classified as restricted, for example. Uh, one way we could, you could do that is you could include quite generous criteria on um, the keyword-based classification. And so when you couple that with the NLP-based one, you're sort of hedged against um, asset class or fund descriptions that don't contain any of the relevant keywords. And then you still have sort of the NLP-based um, interpretation in there. Uh, so that would be one consideration for a more practical setting and how this can be applied. Uh, lastly, I would say that it's, uh, this can also be used in combination with oversight from, from expert users, kind of like how machine learning techniques are applied in um, healthcare. So in x-ray procedures, for example, NLP, or not NLP-based uh, architectures, but rather other machine learning models are used to identify uh, what is likely to be a tumor, for example. And then you have a stage where an expert uh, watches the x-ray or whatever it is, and then makes an expert-based decision whether or not this is something to further investigate. But at least you have that um, sort of machine-based interpretation as well that can give you additional insights. And I think this can be considered in a, in a similar way. So you can have this as a flagging procedure, but then in the end, ultimately let a expert user or a person make the, make the decision whether or not this should be restricted. So that's pretty much it. I think there's some actionable points that can be used to basically build a classifier for funds or any other assets that contain similar natural language descriptions. And so I'm gonna end it there. I just wanna thank you for, for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks.